Hi folks and welcome to this part one of what's going to be a sort of questions and answers uh, series of videos, short videos. Um, so we're going to start this session off by discussion with my regular students. They'll be asking me, um, requesting of me to show them how to do certain things. Those things will include um, adding shadows to your paintings, painting things like crashing waves, uh, moving water, babbling brook, transparent vessels, sort of flower glass vessels, vase. Um, and um, so these will take uh, about five to ten minutes per demonstration. So uh, make yourself comfortable and uh, I hope you enjoy um, the next, probably be about three or four, maybe five of these short sessions. You have the three primaries, red, yellow and blue, and the other three from the six are the secondaries. Now, I'm sure most of you know what those are. The secondaries are produced by mixing two primaries. So if you look at the wheel in your head, we have red, yellow, blue. If we mix red and blue, we all know, I think, we're going to get a secondary colour, and that secondary colour is going to be purple. OK, if you go the other way around the around the little wheel, we, got, we go back to red, but we mix this time the red with the yellow. And you get your secondary colour again, which happens to be orange. Red and yellow make orange. The third secondary colour is mixed from yellow and blue, which of course is green, okay? Now then, here's the thing, and this, this is probably the most important thing you can learn for controlling your colours and understanding colour use. You've, let's take a very typical example, landscape. We'd expect to find a lot of greens in a landscape, wouldn't we, okay? So let, let's put aside the fact that, uh, let's put aside the use of ready-made greens. Let's make our own green. We've, we've just discovered that if we mix yellow and blue, we make a green. That's a secondary colour. Now, directly opposite, every colour is its complementary, okay? So if you can envisage the simple wheel, I'll show it to you here. There's the colour wheel, okay? We're talking about a landscape painting. Let me, I will go, let me just get this on the main screen for you. It'll make more sense. Um... I'll get the larger scale. So we're, we're, paint, we're painting a landscape, okay? We would expect a lot of green. Now then, the trouble is we put in so much green that the painting's gonna look hideous. It's, it's just basically too much green. If we go directly across, okay, we find it's complementary. Now to control your green, all you need to be doing is picking up and adding varying degrees of a red. You're using complementaries to control your colours. Now then, I can go anywhere you like on this colour wheel, and if the same will apply. Let's go over here to a blue. Let's say we're doing a seascape, OK? You'd expect a lot of bluey green, wouldn't you? So um, a bluey green actually might... I'm, I'm trying to work in reverse on my screen here as I see it. So a bluey green would be about here somewhere where my... That, that, that area there, directly opposite our color wheel, we have a sort of purpley red, a cold red. Now, those two colors will moderate each other, okay? As would have the green and the red. Move anywhere you like around the wheel. Let's go over to orange, okay, up here. We've, we've decided that the painting that we're doing uh, requires a lot of warmth. Orange is a good warm color to use directly if but the orange goes mad and we hate it we don't can't stand looking at the painting it's getting too bright too orange we simply go directly across the wheel to its opposite number to its complementary i'm going the wrong way with my other hand here um we go across the road to its uh, complementary and that's what modifies and controls the strength and vibrancy of that orange does that make sense yeah. to everybody yeah. That's a really simple uh, way of getting to understand and control, learning to control your, your colours. Okay. I, sorry, by control, do you mean to darken or...? No, no just to... Um, Claire, just to... Um, it's just too bright. Your orange is too bright or your green is too bright. So you need to take the um, intensity, the saturation, the chroma. There's many words for a bright color. 
just for, in layman's terms, bright color. You've got too bright a green, or you've got too bright an orange, too bright a uh, red. If you've got too bright a color, you go to its opposite number. Because that's what, what I'm dealing with all the time when I'm painting. I start with bright colors purposely because I don't want to end up with a dull looking painting. So I start bright and the opposite color allows me to go just just to sully that color, the bright color, just like almost like putting sugar in your tea. We all like to different levels of sweetness. OK, so um, it's simple. And the nice thing about this method is um, it doesn't matter what your personal taste is, whether you like vibrant, bright looking paintings or whether you like really sullied, neutrally colors, you can this this method will be allow you to get exactly what you personally prefer. OK, but sticking with what your question for a moment, Claire, um, you said, does it does it make them brighter or dark? Yeah. If you mix two complementaries, they knock each other out. They neutralize each other. The more you mix them together, the grayer or sometimes muddier the colors will go. OK. If you want to know what makes a true mud, you're looking at your really warm reds like cadmium red, cadmium red orange. If you mix that with a green, it's opposite number. You, you don't get a neutral per se. You get mud. It's very specific. You get mud. You get a warm, dirty color. But don't dismiss mud because uh, mud is there to show off the bright colors. We use it. We don't avoid mud. But the trouble is because in our early stages, we play around with brush work too much. We push our colors around way too much with too small a brush. We always end up with mud. Um, we always end up mud with mud for those very reasons that I've just explained. It's all about the integration of two opposite colors. So we don't know it half the time, but what we've probably done is we're looking at this muddy painting. We're thinking if we could step backwards, we could go back in time, step backwards. You'd see where it would happen. You think, oh, look, it happened there. I was enjoying this sap green straight out of this tube. Lovely color. Absolutely love this, this sap green color. Um, and then you thought, oh, I'll put a bit of some other color in here. And the likelihood is you probably the eye instinct intuition has drawn your eye to something warmer. So as soon as that warmth goes into that cooler green, that's when you start seeing things change. Um, but it, there's degrees of it. So a warm green coupled with a warm red, you will get mud. You won't get quite so much mud if you had a cold green and a warm red. You certainly wouldn't get mud if you had a cold green and a cold red. You would get a neutral. There is a difference. But for now, don't bombard yourself with too much of the latter. Think about what we, where we started. Uh, learn, the, um, learn to control your, your colour by using complementaries. It's an enormous, enormously important and simple simple thing to learn but that will change your paintings it really will change your paintings for the better um so that said folks um so with techniques wet in wet wet on dry dry brush strength of mix how strong your paint should be when you when you when you're using it and that color complementary controlling just how much vibrancy and intensity you want out of your colors and how to control it. Right, the, then we have to decide because I brought this up because people have said to me things like, oh, could you show me how to paint waves? Could you show me how to paint flowers? First of all, there are a hundred plus ways of painting any subject matter, anything on this planet, okay? So when somebody says, show me how to paint flowers in the loose style or show me how to paint waves in the loose style, what I'm gonna say is, you know, consider these things, shape, scale, what do you want me to do exactly? Shape, scale, and situation or position. In other words, composition, okay? Shape, scale, position. Um, by that, I mean, you have to, you have the proximity from what you have to put, you have to consider, let me give you an example. 
if somebody could say to me, paint a wave, and I'm thinking, now, are they thinking of uh, painting a wave by where perhaps a surfer is caught in the middle of a tunnel of water as they come through the wave? Okay, one example of hundreds. Are you stood on a beach? Are you witnessing a storm coming in, crashing onto a pebble beach? Are you stood on a rock watching the waves crashing up against the rocks? Are you out at sea on a boat watching the pitch and your of, of huge movements of water? There are there so, so you need there isn't this is why I started with technique. What I'm saying is whatever your choice is, whatever the aspect is, whatever your composition is, whatever your aspect is to the subject matter, far away from it, up close to it. Every technique we've just covered will allow you to paint any subject matter on this planet, okay? That's why the technique comes first. Learn those techniques and you can paint anything. Doesn't matter whether it's crashing waves, flat calm water, flowers, uh, misty mornings, it's all, it all starts with the technique. So let's say I've got my techniques in my little kit bag here, okay? All nice and learnt and ready to go. Um, my next move is over here, and that is, okay, I've got a subject. I fancy painting a seascape. Um, my initial thoughts are gonna be this. Am I on a beach? Am I, on, am I looking at rocks? Am I out at sea? You know, they will be different shapes you make. So um, light, oh, the only other thing on top of that then, after shape scale situation or position, which you can combine into composition, is two more things. Light source or light conditions. Is it a bright sky? Is it a stormy sky? And weather conditions. Is it a rough sea, a flat sea, something in between sea? Okay. All these things are, are the next step. And finally, okay, just this little bit, and then we'll get on with some demonstrations. Um, we're loose. <laughs> We have to remind ourselves that we're painting in the loose style because everything I've just said so far could apply to any style. Mm -hmm. OK. Realism, tight, call it what you want. Everything up to this point could apply to all that. So we're now taking those two things, those two things, major things and saying we need to learn this for the purpose of painting loose. And I would just say this, and I'm going to read it off because I won't remember it as I've written it. But so some subject matter will require more of a departure from realism than others. OK. Um, and a perfect example, and I'm going to use the one that you requested, Claire, and that is flowers. OK. Um, the closer you go into your subject matter, and I'm talking about physical proximity here, distance from the object that you're painting, the scale of it on your piece of paper, is it up close, is it from a distance? So we're looking at a vase of flowers on a table that could be 10 feet away, or are we up close in sort of like um, magnification, right up on, on the flower? Um, that will all make a huge difference um, because the closer you go into your subject matter, the harder you will find it to depart from realism. The harder you will find it to depart from tight analytical illustration. Does that make sense, folks? Yeah. yeah. As a loose, my tip is this to you all. As a loose style painter, you need to think generic most of the time, not specific. So even if you go in close, let's say we've got a, a bunch of lilies and we want to home in on just three of those flowers in a bunch of 20 flower heads. You're going to have the hardest job to paint that loose. I just quickly recap on that. So um, the closer you go in, the harder job you will have of painting things um, uh, loosely. But it is possible. It is possible. Everything's possible. Nothing's impossible. Um, yeah, as I say, close-ups will always require a modicum of recognizable characteristic <laughs> of what it's supposed to represent. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, uh, thus making it harder to depart from realism. But when we're dealing with large bunches of flowers, it's almost a doddle. It's, um, I'm giving away my secrets here, how I get away with so much. Um, but really, seriously, you should consider these things. I'm not going to do this in any particular 
uh, routine folks other than um, <coughs> ones that I can remember, okay? And uh, for the moment, uh, those are Claire. And I'm gonna sh I can only show you, Claire, one way of doing it, okay? Yeah. Is it um, perhaps a month from now or whenever I'll be doing an extra something or other and I'll notify everybody about what it's about and, and we'll tackle these things again on further. Um, so, um, and then there was Bob, Misty Morning. Or mis was it Misty Morning? Just general Misty Effects, Bob, wasn't it? Oh, general Misty Effect. I said Misty Morning, but uh, it's okay. generally Misty in the morning, isn't it? So Yeah. That's good. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that should be applied to most situations anyway. And Gwen, I think Gwen, you brought up waves and... and yeah. Yeah. Okay. Again, folks, I hasten to add, can't, I'll try and do more than one very... These will only take a couple of minutes. So you know how quickly I paint. Um, I'm not going to make up scenes necessarily, unless I really have to put in another component that shows off the thing we're trying to show. Um, I know what I mean. It'll, I think you'll know what I mean when I do it. Um, what else was there, folks? Anybody want to fire at me, fire stuff? I have moving water, a river. Oh, moving. yes. A Did river or stream, actually moving. Yeah, okay, like a babbling brook or something like that, is it? Yeah. Sort of, okay, mo moving water. Any, I have, I have about, sorry. Go on, Linz. I asked you about painting a glass vase. Oh, yes. I'll show you examples, if I can, of how to create a glass vase or any glass uh, vessel for that matter. Um, OK. Sea uh, waves. Sorry, I should have written that down. Anybody else, folks? Howard. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, just one thing, can I ask you about proportion? When you're faced with the blank sheet of paper. Yes. And say it's a street scene. Yeah. I don't quite want to explain this. If you've got a figure and there's somewhere in there, there's a door, you can judge really, can't you? There's what size yes. so the person should be. But I, I always find it really difficult. Where do you actually start to judge the proportion do you understand what i mean i don't know if i understand what i mean myself but i, I, I find it I, i'll do a sketch and i'll think well that's that building is way too small or yeah i'm it not explaining myself well, but i do it, find that quite difficult it is a difficult stuff. one jill and, and and i i'm happy to explain it i think perhaps we ought to do a very specific hours lesson on that on that very issue of of scaling your figures in your scenes so that they look correct against doors, buildings, yeah. etc.